My name is Chris Gilmurray, I'm the mayor. Welcome to South Brunswick. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming. It's a very important election. There's great people here, good candidates, and I'm so, I just want to welcome everybody here. Um, it's great to meet you here as well. I may, I may be in your need, I'm sorry, I'll probably do better with my, your need of a doctor right now, I'm, but I'm working and doing, doing as great as I can. So, um, it's once something happens. But we're doing great in South Brunswick, and um, I want to congratulate everybody here, and the candidates are going to do a great job for us. Thank you so much. for coming out tonight. It's such a pleasure to meet all of you. My name is Laurie Poppy and I'm running for State Senate in this district. And we are asking all of you to come out and vote on June 6th in the primary for column B. I'll tell you a little bit about our slate because I'm truly excited about it. We have an incumbent, Andrew, who's a physicist. We have Roy, who's a retired business executive. And I'm a therapist, a social worker, a family law attorney, and a single mom. So I think, I think you probably have your issues covered. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Roy. Thank you very much. And if you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't know that guy, that's okay. I actually get some of that at my own family reunions, so that's quite all right. So let me just take a moment and introduce myself. I live in Hillsborough with my wife Vicki. She is a proud second grade teacher in the Hillsborough Public Schools. And we've been there for about 20 years. We have two dogs and two adult children. And, and I want to let you know for the record, I mentioned the dogs first, <laughs> intentionally. And about two years, about a year ago, I reached out to Andrew and, and I was annoyed in following the leadership and the lack of leadership that was taking place in our state government. That everyone agreed we had problems and things weren't getting done. And I wanted to bring my business experience and leadership and partner with Andrew's background as a scientist to see if we can get things done. And that's why I'm running along with Andrew. Now, I know this is a rally, I know it's a get out to vote rally, but I also don't want to ignore that there was a tragedy yesterday. And, and a horrible thing took place. And I don't want to bring us down, but I also recognize that this is a time for, I believe, for us to show strength. Now there are some that believe showing strength is building <coughs> higher walls. I disagree with that. I believe showing strength is in unity and bringing people together. And that's what our party does. Our party brings people together. And I'm proud to be a Democrat because we bring people together. Two years ago, this district did something unheard of. We elected a Democrat for the first time, Andrew Zwerg. Yeah. South Brunswick put us over the top. Yes. And I want to share with you, and Andrew has done a magnificent job. But I want to share a little secret. He's lonely. <laughs> He's very lonely. He needs company. He needs another assemblyman, and he needs a senator to join him. And with your help, we're going to turn the 16th district solid blue this time. <laughs> Next week, come out and vote. Get everyone you can to come out and vote. Thank you very much. My name's Barb Golden. I am Andrew's worker's wife. And uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, he's down in Atlantic City actually being a science uh, egghead, I guess you could say. He's uh, speaking at the International Conference on Plasma Science, which is part of his day job. However, um, he is deeply sorry that he couldn't be here tonight. Um, he's very excited. I, I'm glad, actually. Um, I get the opportunity to say thank you to South Brunswick and say thank you to Middlesex County because Roy was right. In 2015, 
nobody paid attention to us. <laughs> nobody knew who Andrew was. And Middlesex County and South Brunswick in particular really backed us, along with many of the, of, of the other supporters here in the room tonight. And we really thank you for that. Um, I will tell you that this is a, an incredible year for him. He has done an incredible job. He works very hard, working two jobs, working in uh, the plasma physics lab and the assembly. And um, with your help again, we will uh, get him reelected in, in November. But my job here today is to get everyone rallied up for the June primary. And I have to say that um, uh, South Brunswick has an opportunity again to be a real game changer in this critical, critical election. So I am thrilled to be here um, for Andrew. Uh, I know you'd rather have him up here. However, um, I'm really glad to get the opportunity to tell everybody I'm actually a school teacher and a mom, so I am used to getting my way and telling people what to do. <laughs> and I tell you, um, you need to get out. You need to get to the polls on June 6th. You need to tell your friends to get to the polls on June 6th and in November. You need to tell your family and your coworkers. You need to be obnoxious about it. And it's okay, because it's that important. So um, I thank you for being here, and I thank you for having me um, to join you. And I'm really honored to be here with Governor Dean tonight. It's so exciting. So um, thank you, guys. And uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us. And um, I appreciate you, and I appreciate all the work you're going to do for us again. First of all, two years ago, that was a great victory for Andrew in the 16th legislative district. So let's give them a hand. I want to introduce my friend, Carol Barrett, former councilwoman, former deputy mayor, former freeholder from South Brunswick. Carol. So we're being, the freeholders are being challenged. Leslie and I are being challenged this year. It's one of the few times that the free elders have been challenged in a primary. So we're not taking it for granted. We're out there going to every event. I started knocking on doors last weekend, so you're going to win one vote at a time, knocking on one door at a time, and speaking to the residents and finding out their issues. So we're working as hard as we can to make sure we get a great victory on, on June 6th and a bigger victory on November 7th to keep this county democratic. So thank you, and let's work hard to make sure that that happens. following in Cap Carol when she gave up her seat on the freeholder board I represent the South County Monroe Township is where I was a council president and now I'm on the freeholder board with a great group of people that have welcomed me and I'm following in uh, Carol's strong example of women's leadership on the freeholder board so thank you very much Carol I have somebody with me special who's on her phone right now my daughter <laughs> And, and she's been campaigning with me since she's been in a stroller. And it's not really campaigning. When I look at what I do, what I've done in Monroe Township, and now on the freeholder board, and this is the core, like this is it right here. These are, I mean, we are the Democratic Party. We know we're all going to vote. But we take it, it's, it starts, as Charlie said, knocking on doors, but it starts with our family, and it starts with our friends. So when I'm here dragging my daughter, I did bribe her with some ice cream. But, but the message that I want to ask you and the message that I want to send is be involved at any level. We have school board members here. We have committee people here from around Middlesex County. It's all about being involved. And I can tell you one thing. In New Jersey, they are watching us on a national level. And if you don't think that getting in the primary and getting our Democra Democratic butts out to vote isn't going to be noticed throughout the nation, you're wrong. We need to be out there and we need to be heard. It's unacceptable what's going on right now in New Jersey with, I'm not going to say the names, but and on the national level, we are, we need to get our voice heard. So thank each and every one of you to come out tonight and I appreciate your support. And if I, I would be remiss if I did not say, Line B, from the top to the bottom, <laughs> line B in middle Uh, my name is Sandy Nara, and uh, as with Leslie, I'm one of the new freeholders. Uh, I was appointed to fill Jim Polos' seat in October. Uh, Leslie joined in February. 
Uh, I am not being challenged, but I have my own challenges. I am going to be running in November for a one-year term to fill out Jim Polis's unexpired term. If I'm lucky enough to have all of you return, put me into office, I get to run again in 2018. Um, I, I say that I have my own challenges because um, I, I think it's a little obvious I'm South Asian. And I, uh, I'm pointing this out because Middlesex County now has got one of the most diverse freeholder boards. There are three women on the board. There is an African American male. We have a Hispanic woman. We have myself who's South Asian. The fact, the fact is, is when, with my appointment, I became the first South Asian male or female freeholder in the entire state of New Jersey. <laughs> changing and we need to recognize that and embrace that but I also want you all to know I'm your neighbor from the north I am a North Brunswick girl I grew up in North Brunswick I grew up here in Middlesex County and I'm not planning on ever leaving Middlesex County because this is my home just like it is all of yours and it is important for us to put people in office return people to office who have the best interests of our county and our state at the forefront of everything they do. And I, I mentioned it to the governor, and I'll mention it again. This primary, once this primary is over and we get to the serious work of November, because I know we're gonna get the right people to be on the ballot for November, we also have to concentrate on another thing that our current governor saddled us with. Some of the worst transportation infrastructure in the country. And I'm a commuter. I commute every day to New York City. And I am on the bus, I'm on the train with many of you and many of your neighbors. And what that man has done to us by refusing the ARC tunnel money and everything else that he's done is, it's beyond, I, I will literally say, use the word grotesque. When your friends and neighbors and family members have to worry about making it to work on time, being docked pay, when they have to worry about whether they can get home to uh, pick up their kids from school or miss their child's play or a soccer game, that is affecting people's lives every day in their pocketbooks and in their homes. And so we need to not only get local officials elected who can prioritize what each of their localities need, but we definitely need a governor who is gonna prioritize the needs of the citizens and not be worrying about his future career at some later date, and that is Phil Murphy. And if you elect Phil Murphy, if you elect Andrew Zwicker and his, all of these individuals standing behind me, you know you're gonna get people who are gonna prior, prioritize your needs, first and foremost, because we are all your neighbors, and we go through the same issues, and we believe in all of the interests that you all have here, so that's all. Get out the vote. Uh, everybody sits there and says it's a primary or a democratic state. That's not good enough this year. Every Democrat have to, has to show how they feel about what's going on in New Jersey and in the nation, but coming out even on the primary. So please, bring your neighbors, bring your family, and come out and vote on June 6th, line B. Uh, I'm Elaine Flynn, the county clerk, and I run the elections it, partly in Middlesex County. I have to tell you, last Saturday I spoke at a Federation of Democratic Women luncheon and the topic that I used was every vote counts. While I did research for that particular subject, I was amazed at how many, how many campaigns and how many offices were lost because of one or two or three votes. We think the primary doesn't count it does. You have to get out there and show the rest of the Middlesex County and the rest of New Jersey that every vote counts. I left a whole bunch of vote by mail applications out on <coughs> tables here. Please, if you cannot go on, on June 6th and vote, please fill out an application and send it to my office and we will get you a ballot. Remember, every vote counts. Thank you. Great. So, so it's safe to say that I have the coolest job tonight, right? I get to introduce the governor, right? Yeah. And, and who cooler would you get to introduce the governor than a young dem, right? Yeah. Woo. I, I, 
didn't pull that one, I just ran with it. 12 year governor of Vermont and a former DNC chair. I said I can do that. <laughs> so without further ado, Governor Howard Dean. Phil Murphy sent me here, um, and the instructions were not only to get all these folks elected or re-elected, it was also to vote straight B, column B. We don't have column voting in Vermont, so, but I guess that that might have something to do with uh, Phil Murphy's campaign. Uh, I'm going to talk about Phil for a little bit, but I'm also going to talk about getting out the vote because that's the critical thing. Um, I've known Phil for a long time. He was the DNC finance chair. Uh, it was actually my pick. Uh, we had somebody who was great before, but she had been there for a long time and she left, and so we had to find somebody, and uh, Phil I knew from the campaign. Uh, he's terrific. Uh, he's very good at what he does. He's great at raising money, but the best thing about Phil is he's honest, uh, and he doesn't welch around. There's some big problems in New Jersey, uh, pension problems and all kinds of uh, transportation infrastructure. He, Phil is very bright. Uh, he's not going to lie. He's not going to clog up traffic on a bridge if he doesn't get his way. Uh, he's just a really decent guy, and he's smart, and he's tough. And, you know, he's going to ask, one of the things I like about him the most is when he disagrees with you, he doesn't actually say that. What he does is he keeps asking you questions until you realize that he's right and you're wrong. Um, which is actually fairly refreshing compared to the guy you got there now. Um, so uh, this is a really quality, uh, classy human being, and I think it's going to be fantastic to have him as governor, but it's not an automatic. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, Phil's going to win, blah, blah, blah. It's not true. Um, I, you know, I spent 50 weeks on MSNBC telling everybody that Hillary Clinton was going to win. <laughs> Every week I thought Trump had said something disqualified him. First it was McCain wasn't really a war hero. Well, that's a pretty hard case to make. Uh, then it was the Megyn Kelly stuff. I thought, well, he's definitely dead now. And then on and on it went. Every, every week worse than the last, and then finally he one. Um, so, uh, you know, we've got a huge problem in this country, uh, and it's not going to, the only way you fix problems, you don't start at the top, you start at the bottom. And the biggest problem in the Democratic Party right now, and it's, luckily New Jersey is not one of these problems, because of these fantastic people here, is that people don't pay attention to races like freeholder uh, and municipal clerk and stuff like that. That's how you win. Uh, and that's what the Republicans have done. You know, the Republicans are not anywhere as close to a majority in this country. Most, 68% of the public agrees with us on the issues, on things like Social Security and health care. They agree with us. Um, we're just not well organized enough. And you are the people who organize. This is, the, this is the core group in here. You've all come. I really appreciate it. You're all involved in some way to get out the vote. And you, you, know, you know the tools as well as anybody. Uh, it, you've got to go on Facebook. Uh, you've got to make phone calls. You've got to get people who are marginal to vote. There are going to be some people who aren't going to vote. You're, you're going to know who they are. And you can't do everything. There's probably 50 people in the room. I, we, we know that you can't get uh, 10 million people out to vote here. But you can get more than we got the last time. And that's going to do it. So the primary is critical because if you don't have the right slate, uh, and, and then you can't be ready to win. Uh, and, but the primary is not the end of the race. You know, I know Christie's at 17% or whatever it is, and Trump is probably worse off, but the truth is that doesn't guarantee us anything. We need a positive platform that's going to tell people what we're going to do as Democrats, and it can't be just Trump is a jerk. You know, you, don't, you don't actually don't have to say that. Most people know that. I get it. Um, so, you know, if you listen to Phil talk, uh, or, or watch Andrew's record in the, in the assembly, you can see what people have done and what matters to them. Uh, the mayor, thank you. Uh, I think that's an orthopedic problem, which I'm, I'm, un oh, it is. That's un I'm unqualified to do that. And I wouldn't ask me. Of course, I haven't seen a patient in 25 years for money. So <laughs> you'd be at some substantial risk if you actually came to for my advice. Um, mayors are among my favorites because they actually have to make hard decisions every day and make people mad every day. And that's what you have to do. If you're any good at politics, you're not going to make friends with everybody. You're going to have to make some tough decisions, uh, and you're going to have to do the right thing. And you're going to listen to people before you make those decisions. But getting out the vote is what this is about. I'm really glad and gratified that you all came, because this is a core group that gets the vote out. Do it like you've ne never done it before. This is the beginning of the, of the, uh, the resist movement. It's all nice to have the immigration demonstrations and the women's march. Those are all very, very important things. Voting is what matters. Um, last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to open it up for a few uh, questions. 
if you like. The last thing I'm going to say is that we have some real advantages. We just don't know how to take advantage of them. The younger generation uh, in this country, which I call first globals, because they're the first global generation, most people call them millennials, um, they vote with us consistently. 58% of them voted for Hillary, even more voted for Barack Obama. They actually voted, they, they were the people who were most responsible for getting Barack Obama elected president of the United States. The only election in my lifetime in 2008 uh, where more people under 35 voted than over 65. Now, this is, a, this is a room full of professional people who really know a lot about politics. What is the golden group that you always want to get? It's people over 65. Well, young people voted more often than seniors even. It was incredible. But they're not Democrats. They believe in our values. And it was, <laughs> I really appreciate the, uh, the, the, the remarks from the word was town clerk, or no, 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 wait, the freeholder, the new freeholder. Uh, because one of the things that's, that we have in common with this younger generation is we, the Democratic Party incredibly values diversity, and so does this young generation. They love the fact, all the people that, that Trump hates on all the time, immigrants and uh, Muslims and, you know, whatever, those are, those are the people that actually are valued by the young generation. They get that in a global world, everybody is, is part of the same family. And this is something obviously the Republicans don't get because they've dog, been dog whistling race and all sorts of other things for a long time. So this is, this is our generation, but they don't like institutions because they've never needed them. Unlike us who had to organize to end Vietnam and organize for the civil rights movement and so forth and so on, they can go on the internet and get 500,000 people who agree with them in about 25 minutes and then make Bank of America decide they're not gonna charge $5 a month for a credit card or a debit card. Or they didn't and they went on, bank, they went on got uh, change.org and got 300,000 people to say they're gonna take their money out of Verizon and put it into an AT&T for their cell phones because Verizon tried to charge $2 a month for paying online. That was a corporate ripoff and they stopped it. So they, can have, they have so much power to organize as individuals, we could never dream of that when we were involved in politics. And therefore they think they don't need institutions. I think the election of Donald Trump was a wake up call for this generation. And the reason I think so is because you do need institutions. Institutions are clunky and they're not attractive, but the truth is it's the only way that you can continue your, what you believe in past your own involvement or your own lifetime. That's what institutions will do for you. They have lots of problems, but our institution needs to be rehabbed, the Democratic Party. It needs to be rehabbed. We need to get out there. We need to, we need to learn that, that the wisdom doesn't come from Washington. It comes from any place else, but it's the 50 state strategy. We need to focus on freeholder elections and things like that because that's where the Democratic Party begins their rise to the top. And if you don't feed the base, then get, you know, putting somebody in at the top as anybody in agriculture knows, maybe you can make a graft on some kinds of trees, but most of it doesn't work so well. Um, that's what we really have to do, and we've got to get the young folks involved. And, and I actually don't care if you join the Young Dems or not. I hope you do. But I only want you to join the Young De Dems as a stepping stone, because what I really want to do is have you run for office. That's what I really want to do. Sign up for this man right here after right after we get done here. I'm not I'm not I'm serious about this. I, I I'm I'm sort of thinking you know I don't know who's going to run for president in 2020, but I'm actually thinking that I'm going to have a policy that I refuse to endorse anybody over 55. I think it's my, it's time that my generation gets out of politics. Not for not because we've done a terrible job. I think we we have a record we should be incredibly proud of <coughs> in terms of transporting forming America and transforming the world. But it's time to get the young folks involved and in office so they, and we can teach. There's a lot we know that young folks don't know. Uh, but, but we've got to make this change and, and that's what's going to re really reinvigorate the party. So with that, let me thank you uh, for asking. This is great. Let me thank you all for coming out on a lovely afternoon. Um, a great slate. Go vote for all of them. Take, uh, we have any time, I'm going to take a couple of questions. Yes. 
Um, so it was a big aha moment for me when you were the DNC chair and announced the 50 state strategy. Um, how's the DNC doing on that right now? They've got a long way to go. And, and, and I don't blame anybody at the DNC. The, you know, the nature of both parties, this is, happens in the RNC too, although it's, they're more disciplined and of course have lots more money. The nature of the DNC is to become the reelect for the president when you have an incumbent president. And that's not a good thing, but it happens. Bill Clinton did it too, Jimmy Carter did it. Um, and so the problem is that the strategy tends to collapse on itself because we have the most important office in the, not just in the country, but in the world. And when you do that, the re-election is critical. But the problem is the 50 state strategy withers on the vine, and that's basically what happens. So we've got to reconstruct all of that. My own theory about this is, and some of you have probably read that um, I'm involved with this, Hillary and some other uh, people, is funding some of these internet organizations like Indivisible um, and like Swing Left, uh, like uh, Run for Something, uh, Emerge is another one, that do things that are important uh, for re-elections and for elections, uh, but are totally run by young people. I, I believe that we've got to get young people into institutions, but they're not going to join our institutions. They're going to make their own, or they're going to insist on re-sculpting ours in such a way that you know, we really can't do it. So my whole theory of, of the case, which is what I think we're, is going to happen, is that we're going to help younger people. So see, this, the culture of the internet is they're incredibly successful organizers, but they don't, they're entrepreneurial. They don't particularly work together. They don't work together badly, but they are entrepreneurial. So we've got to get them to talk to each other, stay in their own lanes, and we're going to do that through funding some of the critical ones. Run for something encourages people to run for lo local office. Emerge encourages women uh, to run. They have 39% of their candidates are um, of color, which is really important. I think one of the things that happens that's happened in the African American community since Barack Obama was president is that black people are saying, "Okay, fine. Look, we know you're better than the other party. That's not enough." And it isn't enough, and we've got to get smarter about that stuff. Color of change we're, we're funding. Um, so that this, the party organization looks like the party that we have, the diversity. And that means everybody's got to be in the mix. Everybody's got to have a piece of the pie. It has to be real. It can't be token in some way. So really, I think the way to change the DNC is from the bottom up and from the outside in. Let the DNC do what they're doing. They do what they do fine. But there's a whole culture of political activism that's come up in this generation. Uh, and they don't identify with Democrats. If we want them to identify with Democrats, they're not going to move towards us. We've got to move towards them. Anybody else? The easy stuff got done, not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, how do you propose to do that? How do you encourage young people? They seem to know everything. <laughs> you know, this is a really interesting comment because I hear it all the time from older people. Um, young people, I hear complaints. Oh my God, you hire these people three days later, they're telling you how to run their business. They're not. They're making constructive suggestions. And my experience with young folks is that they make a suggestion, you tell them why it's a bad idea. Sometimes you tell them why it's a good idea, and thanks a lot. You just, it's, it's not like, you know, our generation was so in your face, right? I don't experience these kids as in your face. I think they're just interested in knowing. So they're going to make a suggestion, and it's up to you to tell them it's a good idea or not a bad idea in your estimation. They're going to put that in the mix, and they're going to learn something. I don't, uh, you know, I, I once had this argument with a, a woman who was very, very successful on Wall Street, who was about 45, and she was ranting and raving about millennials, which I, a term which I don't use anyway. And I said, yeah, you know, um, and she said, they're terrible, they're just awful. And I said, yeah, you know, I bet they suggest how to run your business after three days, right? She said, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and I said, I bet if you don't treat them right, they're, they're out the door in, in a week and a half. They don't stay for six months, even if they said, that. yeah, that's right, that's right. I said, where do you think they learned that from? <laughs> so I don't view those traits in young people as threatening. I view that as a way of that, trying to learn something. And I think we just have to say, okay, here's why I think you're right, and here's why I think you're wrong. And you know what? 99% of the time I've ever been in a situation, they appreciate that. So we shouldn't worry about them pushing us out of the way. I think we worry about it because we pushed our parents out of the way during Vietnam and the civil rights. They're not like that. They actually want to learn from us. 
I love this generation. The reason I love it is because they have our values, but they're much smarter about how to figure out how to do it. They absolutely have our values on uh, equal opportunity, on the environment, on how to treat other people, on international relations. They have our values. But they're driven by metrics, not ideology. I can remember those college campuses when we were all about ideology. They actually care about the facts. And if the facts show that the, their ideology isn't correct, that they're willing to do something else. I think that's a good thing. I don't think you can run things without facts, as the Republicans are demonstrating in Washington right now and always have. They never care about the facts. That's another little difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. We care about the facts, they don't. Actually, the real difference is, to digress for a second, I've been thinking about this a lot because we're trying to work with these young folks. Um, the real difference is, and the reason we win young people is because our view, their view, the Republican view of humanity is very pessimistic. You have to control everything. People will always do the wrong thing unless you come down on like a ton of bricks. We actually believe that the world's gonna get better, uh, that all we have to do is encourage fairness, uh, and that uh, if you trust people, they're gonna do the right thing most of the time. That's why young people like us are not them. And we don't dog whistle the way they do about race or gender uh, or sexual orientation or any of these other things. So um, I'm very, even with Trump in the White House, I'm so thrilled to be a Democrat because I think we're going to win because we're right. And if we don't win, the whole place is going down the tubes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the chairman. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you're worried about our party fracturing uh, and uh, Tea Party element type thing rising up and how to prevent that and maintain unity in our party. I assume when you talk about the party fracture, you mean the Bernie Hillary? Bernie. Um, you know, there's always some people that, that want to do that. They get all the, the attention. I don't think that's true. I, the, the young people definitely don't. 80% um, of the people who voted for Bernie Sanders were idealistic, wonderful young people who weren't motivated by politics before and were because Bernie got in. I think that's fantastic. I think it's great. I personally, even though Bernie is not a Democrat, I'm very glad he ran in the Democratic primary because if he'd won as an independent, we would have had no shock whatsoever. So I think 80% are, are of the Bernie folks are helpful. They probably came out and voted for Hillary, some didn't. Um, I think 10% of them, or maybe a little fewer, are Trump voters. Now, I know Bernie well, because in Vermont, a huge, uh, uh, a huge constituency group of his are the people who voted for Trump. Um, he's an amazing guy, he's an incredible politician. He has never voted for a defense appropriation or a war. He can go to the, into the American Legion or the VFW and they come out and they will love him. And they'll cheer for him and they'll vote for him. He just goes in and he says, the millionaires and the billionaires, they're taking your money from the veterans and you're not getting your share of the benefits you were promised. <laughs> and they love him. And they go to the parades with the, with the hats on and they say, go Bernie, go give it to him. And they love him. And then there's, there's, there's always a portion of people in the world, whether you're talking about Bernie's people or anybody else's, that I call the sourpuss party. And they are people who actually don't want to win. Because that, I, I did some work for a party in Britain once and I realized that half the party didn't want to win because it was they're much more comfortable complaining about everything <laughs> and, and maintaining their position as a high moral ground than they actually would be if they got their hands dirty and had to make compromises that people weren't going to like. You can't do anything about we had all those people in our generation. You always have them, but that's that's a tiny minority of the people I think Bernie Sanders got out. So I'm th I was thrilled that Bernie ran. I was for Hillary, but I was thrilled that Bernie ran. I think he did a great service for the country. I think most of those people want to do the right thing, and the right thing is to have a fundamental change. And I also think the Democratic Party learned a lot from Bernie running, which is that we do not have to be afraid of things like single payer. Um, look, whatever your position is, and it's very expensive. We tried to do it in Vermont. It was so expensive we couldn't do it. And I think we're, the whole country is going to have to do it. We missed, you know, we missed what would have been a single payer by a single vote, which was Joe Lieberman changing his mind yeah. at the last minute. If we'd had a public option right now, you would not have the problems we're having with the insurance in industry in Obamacare because you'd have the, operate, uh, the option of signing up for Medicare if you were under 65. Um, so, you know, we're going to get there. We may not get there fast enough. We won't get there at all unless you have people like Bernie and his people pushing us as hard as he can. I think that's a good thing. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank you.